Welcome to run of the week number 10. My cold is back, so I'm going to try and make this quick. Hey, today I'm going to talk about this guy again. Eklund Kachi. He, uh, uh, he was featured in rack run of the week number 5. And I showed him uh, running out a rack of 10 ball in the 2021 Predator 10 ball. He just won it again last week. That's two out of three that he's won. I think it's worthwhile to talk about this match, and I think there's some cool lessons in here. I'm a, I'm a fan of Eklund Kachi largely because he's six foot five, just the same as me. So I, I kind of look to him, I kind of model him as far as stance and, and uh, body position, alignment, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's been a help to me. Uh, even if you're not six foot five, the way he plays is something that any player would, uh, would be uh, fine to their advantage to model after. And let's take a look at the current top uh, Fargo ratings in the world. Uh, I think Kachi gets overlooked sometimes, and that's unfortunate because he is literally one of the top players in the world. If you look at this list, it's, and this is a very short list, Joshua Filler's at the top with 841. Fedor Gorst, Francisco Sanchez Ruiz, Shane Van Boning, Dennis Ocolo, Jason Shaw, and Eklund Kachi. He's tied for 6th, uh, 7th with Jason Shaw at an 826 Fargo. I have a question for you guys. Wasn't there a time, maybe a few years ago, when Shane Van Boning was number one in the world and his Fargo wasn't any higher than 826? I I'm curious about that. I'm not sure. So right now, Joshua Filler's at 841. Is that the highest Fargo that we've ever seen in the top 100 in the world? Or has Shane or someone else ever been higher than 841? I'm curious about that. These numbers are just astronomical. And that just shows you, if we look, if we look at the Fargo list below 826, it's just full of world beaters. And Eklund Kachi is in the top tier of players in the world. So please don't overlook this guy. Give him a lot of credit. And uh, we'll take a look at, his, at one of his runouts today and, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. First, I want to look at this break shot. This is just one representative break shot that I noticed uh, something that was happening throughout the tournament. And that's that the balls were clustering on the side of the table that the player was on. Joshua Filler here is breaking from the left uh, side from his point of view. Watch the result of this break shot. Made one ball in the side pocket. All nine remaining balls are on this side of the table, the same side of the table that he broke from. Player after player, when they're breaking from the side rail, Ruiz was breaking from the right side rail quite often. The balls will cluster on the side of the table uh, that they broke from. And often, there, there wouldn't be as many up table balls. There might be six balls in this area. Is that common for nine ball? I mean, for ten ball? Uh, I don't play as much ten ball as I do anything else or watch as much ten ball. So you guys who are big ten ball fans, is that common? I don't think so. I think it's unusual. I think even when players are breaking from the side rail on other tables, you get a more even spread. But this type of thing was happening a lot. Let's take a look at, uh, here's the impact. Here's just after the cue ball impacts the rack. Now take a look. The cue ball's impacting the rack from this direction. So balls on this part of the rack are heading this way. Balls on this part of the rack are heading that way. Okay? So you got the one, seven, eight, and five that are heading to the left or to the opposite long rail from where the breaker broke from. Now, we'll move ahead a little bit. If I can get my thing to work, there we go. And that's not quite the end position yet. Right there's the end position of the, of the break. So it was one, seven, eight, and five. Those are the four balls that were on the left side of the rack, went to this rail and over to this side. The other, the other balls went this direction and either went up here or just, just up here or stayed in the rack area. I think this is a function of the cloth and the table. The, the, the cloth, it was a fast cloth, 
but the balls slowed down. They decelerated quickly at the end of their run. And you saw that with the position play. The cue ball would decelerate at the end of its run. That's my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments. That's why you see this type of result, or saw this type of result so often in this tournament. However, the winner of the tournament, Eklund Kachi, broke right from the middle. And he's a big, strong guy. Man, was he hitting them hard. And if you compare everyone else's breaks to Eklund Kachi, he had an even distribution of balls around the table. That's my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's take a look at, uh, at Eklund's run. By the way, I think it's important to point out the last two matches that Eklund played, he defeated Filler and then Ruiz in the finals. Eklund was behind both players by at least three games. I think it was five to two in both matches. He was behind. He won seven games in a row in the Filler match. And then he put on a similar run uh, of games in a row in the Ru Ruiz match. And at the, I mean, Ruiz was the favorite. I even thought that Ruiz was going to win and, and capture all three world championships in one year, but it wasn't to be. I think he got a little bit shocked because um, Kachi really came on strong and played so solid. Let's take a look at Kachi's break shot. He started out the tournament breaking with his bridge on the rail, and then later in the tournament, he moved his bridge hand onto the cloth. But watch how hard he hits it. Look at the cue ball got hit twice. Look how fast the cue ball is moving because it got slammed twice. But the result of his break shot, I think they'll go to an overhead camera. Yeah, there we go. Um, notice that the balls were heading in all directions. And so here we are at uh, the final position of the balls. You got four balls on one side of the table and five on the other plus the cue ball. And just this is more typical of Kachi's breaks, an even distribution of balls. Now, this is a risky break because when you're hitting that hard, you're not going to be able to control the cue ball as well. A lot of his breaks, the cue ball was getting slammed around. I'm surprised he didn't uh, scratch more often on the break. So, But it worked for him, didn't it? So anyway, this is the result of one of his breaks versus... Joshua Filler, here's a good look at the layout. I was really impressed at this run. And the reason is you've got at least two problems. The two ball doesn't pass the four. The eight and ten are tied up. The six wants to go in this corner, but you're kind of blocked. Access to it is blocked by the seven ball here. So it looks like a problem rack. It looks like the type of rack that the... Uh, the player is going to make a ball or two and then play safe. That's what I was expecting. Even I was expecting it on the, on the, on the two ball because uh, Kachi has a, a, a very makeable shot on the one, but controlling the cue ball is going to be difficult. And where are you going to play position for the two? Are you going to try and come down and knock it out, out uh, you know, from behind the four ball? Are you going to try and come behind it? What are you going to do? This is kind of in line with what I was talking about recently I posted a video about the uh, Mika Immonen, Jeffrey DeLuna conflict, and I talked about the fact that the best champion players uh, proceed from a point of view of acceptance. In other words, accept all outcomes. So this is the outcome of this break shot. And Kachi isn't worried. He isn't being negative. He does, he, he's going to accept whatever happens. And because of that, He's able to make a very good effort. Watch where the cue ball goes on this shot. Notice how much time he's taking to get it right. He hit that ball cleanly. It didn't brush the point. And the speed control is, this is good though. The speed control is the cue ball's here just off the rail with a good angle on, uh, to cut the two ball up in the corner and get a shot on the three. He doesn't have to. If he didn't get that position, he'd be able to play a safety, of course. But he put in the extra effort. If you watch him before the shot, I kind of missed it, but if you go back and watch this before the shot, he took quite a bit of time before he got down on the ball. He took quite a bit of time standing here, looking and visualizing exactly what to happen. This is something, um, I picked this up recently on one of Tor Lowry's videos. 
he talks about the how do you play position with precision with precision when you're trying to move the cue ball all over the table this is how you know after many many hours of practice you simply need to look at the shot visualize where you want the cue ball to stop and how it's going to get there your uh, body will take over it will know what to do if you give it the time to look and visualize exactly what you want and so that's what Kachi did they're, they're play, replaying the shot just a perfect cue ball now let's look at the two ball shot because there's an interesting lesson here he's you know this is a long shot and al almost all of us are going to consider this to be a long difficult shot little tip for you guys here's the shot line for the two ball I'm gonna try and draw a straight line okay and then here's the aim line well you know from the ghost ball position aim line to the cue ball it's a slight cut isn't it but we, we still find it pretty difficult so here's one thing you can do imagine that the rail was here and the corner pocket was here and the side rail then would be here it's exactly the same cut angle, but the, cue, the two ball only has to travel from here to here to get into the corner pocket. Now how difficult is, the shot is, is this shot? That's a little tip for you. This is how to make these long object ball cut shots up into the corner pockets, is stand behind the shot, visualize that the corner pocket is here, not over here. And it's an easy shot. And when you do that, now you're not worried about position as much either because he's, he's hitting with a high ball. The cue ball is going to go to the rail and come out to center table. He'll have a shot on the three ball in the same pocket. So just a little tip. Try that. See if that works for you. A little visualization tip. And even, and even though I say that, look how roughly he hit the ball. It hit just past the, the sec, second diamond. But at that speed, it's still going to go in uh, on most tables. Yeah, look where it hits. Yeah, about, about a diamond and a half from the corner pocket. Then this is a good shot on the three ball. Remember, this is a rack that I expected Kachi to play safe on. Most people are going to make a few balls, maybe get to the six, maybe play safe on the eight, who knows. So now he's got a shot on this three ball. This is a shot you need in your repertoire. I want to go back here. Because he needs to shoot the four ball next. Now, if all these balls weren't in the way, you'd, you'd fire this ball in the corner, send the cue ball to the rail, and back out for a shot on the four ball, wouldn't you? Most, I think most of us would. Look at the angle he has on that. You need to have this shot in your repertoire. He's going to be aiming this with some right English to throw the ball in and just hit it with a very soft uh, kind of pinch stroke, and the cue ball is going to move about that far. Take a look. Watch the cue ball spin. See that? That's what I call, it's kind of a pinch shot with it. I call it dead weight. In other words, the energy that the object ball is receiving to send it to the pocket is simply the weight of the cue ball hitting it. He's not hitting it any harder than that. It's called a dead weight shot. And in addition to that, he's putting a lot of right hand spin on the cue ball to throw the object ball in the pocket, which holds the cue ball so the cue ball doesn't travel so far. If you don't have that shot in your repertoire, take a half hour one day and just kind of set that shot up and play with it. Once you get a feel for it, it's um, very powerful. And so this is another shot. Super difficult. Let's see if the camera angle goes back to the overhead. Now look at the time he took to visualize this. How hard is this shot? How, what's your make percentage on this shot along with getting position on the six ball? He's elevated over the 10. He's got to cut this ball to the right, stun to the rail, and, and up. He doesn't want to come straight across, get behind the seven. He doesn't want to accidentally spin it in, and then the cue ball comes up way too high. The key to this shot is, even though you're elevated, is to stroke it. We, we tend to get hurried and jabby with our stroke. But you want to stroke this the same way that you stroke every other shot when your cue's level. And notice how he stayed still after the shot. And another thing he did was not get too close to the six ball just I mean he didn't even make it to center table but he's got a good angle he's lo already looked and the six ball clears the uh, the eight ball into the pocket and so he's got now he's got a natural angle to come off the rail and he wants to get below the shot line to the side pocket he wants to get on 
on this side. So this is probably the first shot in the whole run that's been somewhat routine. And he played it two rails. You see, you see him kind of wiping the sweat on his hand and taking a breath. One shot at a time. Acceptance. That's how you manage a difficult run out. You don't get in a hurry. Just take one shot at a time. Look at everything. He just, he just looked at the angle and again. He, did you see him walk over and look at what he wanted? Because he can't shoot the eight ball up here past the 10. He needs the cue ball to go to the side rail and out. Now, how easy would it be to hit this wrong and the cue ball either goes too long and or freezes to the head rail? You don't want either of those to happen. In order to get the cue ball to come, he wants to come past, come to the rail and past so that he can shoot the eight ball down here. But you don't want the cue ball uh, too long. You don't want it over here on the end rail, over here. So in order to do that, you need to put a good follow stroke so that the cue ball doesn't deflect. You want it to go forward off of this rail, but to the right spot so that it misses the eight coming off the rail. I hope all that made sense. And you need to hit it. You need, so you need to have enough forward rotation so that it goes forward off the seven, but not so hard that it goes all the way to the rail and freezes to the end rail. And uh, he took a sigh of relief there because he hit that pretty darn good. Once again, if he didn't hit it right, let's say the cue ball came way over here, play a stop shot, park the cue ball here, play a safety. So he's, he's had the option of playing a safety on every one of these shots, but he's hit them all good. And that's the mark of one of the most elite players in the world. That's what it takes. So now it's, this is, I mean, this isn't routine, but it's kind of routine. He just has a stop shot. He took his extension. Do you see that? You, you have one extension per rack. Might as well use it when, when you need, uh, when you just, just to give yourself a little more pace, a little more time. So just wants to cinch that ball, keep, and hold the cue ball here past the, the 10 and the 9 and 10, and then, then are pretty much routine. I'll let you shoot them. This is one example out of a dozen that I could have chosen, or a couple dozen. Example of Ekonkachi running out from nowhere, from where you think it would be a real difficult run. By just one shot at a time and really visualizing and making a really concerted effort to get the cue ball not just good, but exactly where it needs to be. It's come up a few times uh, lately in some lessons I've given. Everyone wants to know, how do you get better? How do you get to the next level? How do you advance? How do you get to be a pro, et cetera? W one of my answers is that there comes a point in your pool journey when you become good enough that from that point on, most of your progress comes not from learning anything new but for, from refining and really imprinting and improving what you already know. During another match, Alex Laley was commenting, and that topic kind of came up, and he had this to say. Be guys who are tier two, and they think, yeah, when do I get to tier one? I said, well, all it takes is just one kick shot mistake less per match, one safety mistake less per match, one missed ball less, and one better break, which adds up to be a lot, actually. One less miss per match, one better safety per match, etc. It's the little things. You're not, once you get to a certain point, you're not going to learn a whole lot new. You're simply going to really improve your execution of what you already know. Alex Laley knows what he's talking about. Eklund Kachi has done it top tier player. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something and good luck in your journey as you work to improve your, your fundamentals and your skills. Next week, I promise we're going to look at some one pocket. Yeah. All right. Thanks for watching. See you later.